Hey, everybody. My name is Brian Heater. I am TechCrunch's hardware editor. I am very pleased to be joined once again. It's actually been a few years by Mark Raybert. Uh, since its foundation in the early 90s, Boston Dynamics has become one of the world's foremost robotics developers and researchers. Mark, the founder, uh, stepped down from the CEO role in 2019 and currently serves as the company's chairman. Last year, he became the executive chairman of Boston Dynamics AI Institute, a Hyundai-sponsored organization focused on developing cutting-edge AI and robotics applications. Mark, thank you so much for joining us once again. Good to see you, Brian. So we're here to talk about the Institute. We're here to talk about robotics. We're here to talk about Boston. I think it's at the top of our list. So, so let's kick off with that. Uh, I, I realize the name of the company limits your geographic options a little bit, but <laughs> was it clear from the earliest days that Boston Dynamics was always going to stay in the Boston area? Well, you know, I'm kind of a lifelong Boston person. I grew up in New Jersey, but my mother grew up here. So I had a connection to Boston, you know, from, uh, from a very early age. Uh, and, you know, I love, I love Boston. Uh, I went to school here, you know, left for 10 years and then, uh, you know, eventually was faculty at MIT. Uh, you know, I was a professor there for 10 years before starting, uh, Boston dynamics. And, uh, you know, when we started, it was halftime Boston Dynamics, halftime MIT. So we started just next door. So it wasn't really motivated by Boston being a hub of robotics. It was just, you know, where I was and where I was comfortable. And so we started here. Uh, we did open a California office. We have a California office now. Boston Dynamics does, not the, uh, yeah. the Institute. That, that was uh, a result of an acquisition. Uh, not really. Uh, we... It was after we were out of Google, we, uh, oh yeah, yes, it was a result of our acquisition of Kinema, which was uh, in Palo Alto, I think, when we first got them. And then we opened an office in Mountain View, which is still there. But Boston is home, is the basic yeah. answer. I actually didn't know you left for 10 years. What did you do in the meantime? Uh, three years at the Jet Propulsion Lab back in the 1970s, <laughs> and then uh, six years at Carnegie Mellon on mm -hmm. the faculty in both the Robotics Institute and the Computer Science Department. Well, well, the second part makes a lot of sense, but were there, were there a lot of robotic applications for JPL at the time? Uh, it was fledgling, but they had a, a mock-up of a Mars rover this back in the 70s. Now it looked like a car and it had... Uh, I don't know if you remember the old Stanford arms, the, mm -hmm. the ones that had a, a sliding joint. So it had one of those on uh, and it had some cameras. And then there were a couple of different groups working on it. But in addition to that, Tony Bakesy, who uh, was a, uh, a researcher in tele-robotics, he had a lab. So I split my time between Tony's lab and, uh, and that Mars rover group. This was my first job after grad school. So you did make that a move. You did make that move to the other side of the country initially. Um, and I've heard a lot of people talk about the the brain drain that cities like Pittsburgh or Boston have, have undergone. Uh, how large of a problem was that exodus to places like San Francisco or New York in the early days? You mean of of our of talent? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think we've lost too many people to uh, to the West Coast, but you know sometimes that happens. When we were part of Google, there was a group of us from Boston Dynamics who moved out to the West Coast, and I don't think I think those people mostly stayed. Uh, and when we got out of Google, they didn't come back uh, with us. Uh, but you know, Boston has its own uh, charms and attraction, and there's lots of tech here, lots of schools. Uh, doing good stuff. You know, there's MIT, Northeastern has an incredible robotics activity going. When you come uh, in April, you should try and visit over there. It's very impressive. Yeah. Uh, Worcester Polytech has a group. There's Holly Yanko at, um, uh, I'm, I'm blocking on the, okay. on the university, University of Massachusetts. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot going on. Yeah, Yale Harvard with the Weiss, the Weiss lab. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So 
when you have these conversations and, and obviously, you know, with the Institute being in play now with, I assume you're looking at a lot of, you know, recent or soon to be grads from schools like MIT, what's your pitch for roboticists and why they should stay in Boston? Uh, you know, mostly we just focus on what the Institute's doing and the work. We don't, I don't think it comes up explicitly as a, as a geography thing. Mostly it's about what's the work going to be, uh, how committed are we to research as opposed to uh, product development. And, you know, that's the lever or the decision that most people make. Do they want to be working on a company that's developing a product? And, you know, there's some advantages of that uh, for some people. And then our long suit is that we're working on, you know, five to eight to 10 year horizon where we can work on uh, problems where you can really dig in on the technical issues and uh, and do that. And there are a lot of people that love that that idea. So how dramatically has Boston and the Boston ecosystem changed in the 30 plus years since the company was founded? Well, you know, these days, I, I don't even know how many startups there are in the area. You know, there's all the logistics companies. There must be a dozen of them, uh, which all have uh, robotics talent uh, at them. Uh, there's uh, the social robot activity, you know, Cynthia Brazil's uh, uh, company and uh, and others like that. And, uh, you know, new things are springing up all the time. The pizza company, uh, I can't remember exactly the name, that, that was here. Uh, but, you know, to be honest, I think more globally, I'm always thinking of us being a, uh, an international company. And, you know, now that we have, we meaning Boston Dynamics, have spot robots uh, all around the world. There's about a thousand of them out there now. Uh, you know, it, it's not just all about Boston. Sure. Yeah. But obviously there are certain benefits in terms of infrastructure when it comes to running an institute full of uh, roboticists and AI researchers. Right. Well, you know, the recruiting here is great. There's Amazon that's got robotics people. Google is right across the street. They don't exactly have robotics in Boston, but obviously they have a lot of uh, talent in AI and software. Uh, so those are potential uh, employees. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of technical people. But we recruit all across the country and, and somewhat from Europe. Uh, so we've been getting, uh, you know, applicants from all over. Yeah, obviously the conversation is different when you're trying to attract somebody to your company versus uh, a student at a place like MIT or Harvard that's looking to found their their own startup. Um, you know, insofar as you're aware of it, that as a former faculty member at places like MIT and CMU, are schools like that doing enough to help students found startups? Well, you know, when I started Boston Dynamics. One of the key events was uh, the MIT hired a technology license office, office person uh, who had been at Stanford. Stanford at that time, this was 30 years, 30 something years ago, uh, was ahead on the curve of stimulating spin outs and uh, startups. And uh, this guy moved, they hired him at, at uh, MIT. And I can remember going into a meeting where I was totally skeptical that my future could possibly involve leaving MIT and starting a company. And in a one hour meeting, he, uh, you know, he changed my mind, mostly because he said, um, if the founding people, if the people who did the invention aren't bought in and excited about the, the company, it doesn't have a chance of success. And so the whole program that they had at MIT was designed to motivate and inspire and really support uh, the founders. Uh, and when I, I just expected that MIT would be, you know, hugging the IP like this, and instead they were saying, you know, take it as far as you can. And uh, I think that's different than some schools. You know, we've negotiated we being a company have tried to get IP from uh, from some universities and they're really holding it close with very restrictive terms and all that. And, uh, you know, it, it's discouraging when you get in that situation. But anyway, so, uh, so that was, uh, I can't remember your question, but one thing that happened was MIT encouraged that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, you know, explicitly about sort of like incubating and accelerating startups, but it's, it's interesting to hear that they were, it sounds like they were also ahead of the curve by a couple of decades. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, uh, that really made some things happen. There were also other activities like the, the 50 K activity at MIT, where someone had, uh, every year they would, uh, fund startups uh based on their evaluating their business plans oh the other thing i was going to say is there's olin college uh i don't know if you know olin but mm -hmm. it's another area college it's, it's a very interesting college because uh everybody's tuition is paid for by the school uh so that's kind of a uh an equalizing thing but they have a very strong uh development of entrepreneurial uh spirit and uh we've you know we've had a number of interns at boston dynamics from there and they were always gunning to, you know, to start their own company. That was their uh, their plan. So I think it's been a, a force here in the Boston area as well. So obviously your your wardrobe hasn't changed since you left the CEO role at Boston Dynamics. But uh, how has your day to day changed since leaving? Well, you know, when there was a point at Boston Dynamics where we were clearly turning more commercial. Uh, and I decided that I wasn't the right guy to to do that. I had also heard a talk uh, by, unfortunately, I can't remember his first name. His last name is uh, Blankenfein, who was the chairman of uh, is it Lance? J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, one of those places. And he gave a talk about his decision to uh, to step down. And he said, you know, you really need to step down when things are going great. If you step down when things are in trouble, then they think you're a bum and they kick you out. But if you do it when it's going great, it's hard because things are so much fun. Uh, but that's when you have to do it. So I listened to that and decided he was right. And uh, that plus the fact that we were turning to commercialization. So I became the chairman and uh, appointed, uh, you know, Rob Plater had been my right hand man. He'd been my graduate student at MIT, mm. been with me for 30 years, almost 30 years at that point, 27 so he became the CEO and, uh, and you know, I, I didn't have enough to do, to be honest. And then COVID came. So, you know, everybody is even withdrawn further. And so it was kind of sleepy and slow. And, you know, I thought about retiring. I'm old enough to retire. Uh, and then- You certainly dressed for retirement. <laughs> well, I've always been dressed for retirement. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things about this life. It's it's um, it's fun and work at the same time. You know, what could be better than that? Uh, but then uh, when uh, Hyundai agreed to fund the Institute, I decided I needed to be here every day to work and to inspire the others. And it's been great. It's it's just like being back in it full, full bore. So uh, uh, I've been loving it, been working hard, uh, and uh, I couldn't be happier. How much of that push towards commercialization or push towards productization was a result of the Hyundai acquisition? Um, it really started, I think the tip of it came when we were still at Google. Uh, but then SoftBank, you know, the first, we were with SoftBank for four years, I think. And the first two years, it was just all about the future. And then, uh, you know, it got to be more about, uh, what the products were and, uh, you know, tightening up the the bottom line and that kind of stuff. And when, when we got there, uh, you know, we turned, but I think another force is that Rob Plater has always wanted to, uh, commercialize. I, I'm a research guy. Uh, I really want to work on the long term and, you know, make the, the next generation or the generation after that happen of robots. Uh, but Rob is really, uh, you know, interested and committed, to the commercialization side. I think you might've seen, I think there was a Boston Globe article that said the company uh, was all about making money now. Uh, and uh, so I think it's been a great, uh, you know, a great path where I'm going on the path I like and uh, the company is continuing, you know, to do, do great work, including research uh, as you can all see. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously there's, it's good to have a company that is self-sustaining and that can generate its own money. Yeah. So was the AI Institute, was that part of the Hyundai deal from the beginning? 
No. Um, so the origin of the Institute is uh, after I became chairman and started to get bored, I wrote a proposal that I actually shopped around to a few billionaires and uh, and got someone to uh, to agree at a level that wasn't enough, in my opinion. Uh, then COVID happened, so I couldn't you know, go and, and visit people as easily. So I kind of slowed down. But then after the Hyundai deal happened, it was all done. I, I pitched it internally and, uh, and they went for it. And, uh, you know, and here we are. So beyond, you know, the obvious contribution of, uh, 400 million from the start, what is Hyundai's relationship to the Institute? Well, they are, you know, they're the only stockholder uh, at the in the current arrangement. Um, you know, the, it's been very collaborative. Uh, I talk to there's some managers involved, but I also talk to the chairman on a regular basis of uh, of Hyundai. He's a real enthusiast. He's he's really, uh, you know, leaning into the future where uh, software, uh, AI, and other high tech things, EVs are you know central to to hyundai to hmg and uh you know we're just a part of that leaning in process both boston dynamics and uh the ai institute is pure research is that a hard thing to sell to a you know a giant multinational automaker uh you know it's only a year it's actually the institute's only been around since last sure. summer although the it's been in the works for over a year uh, you know, you never know until later uh, what the staying power is. Right now, my pitch is to avoid products because products force you into quarterly and annual work. Products force you into all the various needs of all the various customers. And, you know, they have a lot of good information, but they also take you in lots of directions. And if you want to you know, do the vision of what's going to come next. I think it has to come from the technical people uh, who are developing it. Uh, and so uh, the Institute, right? And we, I, you know, I proudly say we're not doing products. You know, if downstream, does Hyundai get bored with that? I don't know, but this is what we're doing. And basically no one's trying to um, to steer me at the at the moment. This this philosophy of of avoiding products was that was that part of Boston Dynamics mission statement at the beginning? Boston Dynamics, no. Uh, okay. No, and we you know we had products. Um, we had some software products in the very early days that uh, that we actually made money on. Uh, you know, in the early days, we were always in the black because we didn't have any investors up until Google acquired us 20, 20 something years in. So we always had to be uh, making money. Some of it was, a lot of it was contract work, but we also had some software products, not robot products, but software products. Um, so, uh, but no, we uh, didn't, we ahead. didn't say we're not going to do products or we're not going to make money uh, in those days. So aside from sharing a name, what is the Institute's relationship with Boston Dynamics? Uh there's, there, I mean, we're just friendly, but um, we don't have any IP from Boston Dynamics. It's really just uh, sharing the name uh, at the moment. And of course, I meet uh, well, and I'm on the board there. Um, we haven't, we've been, we haven't been recruiting from there, although we have a few people, uh, most of whom uh, uh, either left on their own or or something like that. And of course, Al Rizzi, who's the longtime uh, chief scientist there, is the CTO at the institute. Uh, he kind of, we, we came together uh, to it. So we're just loosely connected. So if product, if productization and, you know, commercialization aren't focuses for, for the Institute, what happens with the IP and the patents and the other things that are developed in the Institute? I mean, we have a, a, a multi-pronged plan. Uh, we can do spin outs, which it's interesting, spin outs are by some are seen as a way to commercialize. For me, it's a way to protect the Institute from productization, from products. <laughs> just, just sort of push them yeah. out and let them do their own thing away from the- That's right. Because, you know, we yeah. have really smart people who are inventing stuff 
and you know you know that they're going to be uh, product good product ideas and so we're we're you know we expect to spin them out uh maybe you know maybe incubate them a little bit if that's what they need um there's also licensing to possibly to Boston Dynamics possibly to uh to Hyundai or third parties you know we're nowhere near that yet uh you know we're yeah. only a few months in so we don't have any any real IP at this point we just have talent at this point sure but you know i assume these are conversations that that happen early on right. but it sounds like there's no foregone conclusion that anything that's developed by the institute is going to end up at Boston Dynamics or Hyundai no no that's right so you know, we discussed the difference between the the work being done at you know Boston Dynamics, which, as you said, you know, is doing research, but now is also very much focused on bringing products to market. But how does the institute's research differ from the work at universities like MIT or CMU? Well, first of all, let me talk about the structure. Um, well, let's see. I'll, first, let me talk about the difference with Boston Dynamics. I think there's two main uh, differences. One is we're aimed five to eight to even 10 years out. And I think most of the work at Boston Dynamics is aimed at, you know, uh, what's the next product? Well, satisfying the current set of customers. What's the next product going to be? And, uh, and, you know, developing on a shorter time frame uh, as you need to if you're commercializing and, uh, and making products. The other difference is Boston Dynamics is pretty squarely focused on the physicality of the robot, including the ability to create behavior that responds with its environment, but less so on the AI side of things. How do you communicate with the robot? How do you make robots that can plan things? Uh, you know, basically, robot, all robots today are about as dumb as doorknobs. And People see a robot doing parkour and backflips, and they think well, that's just like a person. Uh, but in almost every other dimension, yeah. it's not anything like a person. You can't communicate with it. It can't write its own programs. Uh, its perception is usually limited to the things right around it and its environment. And, so and one the of the things, uh, one of the things I appreciate that Boston Dynamics has done that I feel like more companies should do is release the longer cut. You know, release the bloopers, release like all of the er, all, all of the difficulties and the trial and error that went into making those beautiful parkour videos. Well, you know, back when I was just a an early professor in the early '80s. I made a robot that balanced itself, you know, a one-legged pogo stick robot. And I showed that and no one cared. And then I showed one where I showed it falling over, how quickly and easily it tips over. And then all of a sudden everybody appreciated, oh, uh, that was that was hard. That was interesting. So the, you know, the bloopers are a great tool for making people see uh, the accomplishment in a, in a bigger light. It, it also shows the frailties but it it also strengthens the uh, the accomplishments. So, I agree. So you know, again, we we discussed a little bit of the differences between Boston Dynamics the company and Boston Dynamics the institute. But obviously, there's so much great work being done in universities right now. What what opportunities are you afforded at the institute that they don't necessarily have at those schools? Well, I think in the institute, you know, you have a university which is full of smart people with uh, blue sky ambitious goals to do uh, new novel things. And then you have a corporate lab, which has uh, teamwork. They have uh, support from hardware, software, sensor, electronic engineering. Uh, and they have uh, schedule and uh, budget discipline. And I think of the Institute as being right in the middle, having larger scale uh, teamwork. We plan to have about 50 people in engineering that supports the work of the researchers, in addition to other engineering people in the research groups, uh, while we're trying to maintain that you know, future, how to make the future happen and solve really the fundamental problems in robotics, not just the feature that, the, that is needed right now, but how do you really make robots smarter so that they understand the world they're operating in, 
So you can say, you know, see that guy over there, what he's doing? Uh, do that instead of having uh, a dozen programmers work for a month to get that program. So that's what we're trying to do. And I think the scale of having uh, those teams is really going to be important. So you asked what that's going to let us uh, do. I think we'll be able to, you know, obviously uh, chat GPT is all the rage. And I don't think chat GPT is the right thing for, for many of the tasks that robots do. But the idea of a foundation model tuned to the functionality of uh, what robots need to do in terms of their perception, communication, planning, I think that's a real possibility. But to do that, you have to work it at a larger scale than most uh, university research labs can do. Also, to build hardware, you know, I think part of Boston Dynamics' success is that they've built, invested in a team that can build really high performance and reliable hardware. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do that too because I think you need to have the software and the hardware uh, working like this uh, in order to succeed in this uh, business. So the the concept of a multi-purpose humanoid robot comes around every few years. Uh, you've been involved in one of the more notable examples, uh, the Atlas robot. Does that that bipedal form factor ultimately make a lot of sense? Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, Elon thinks so. That's that's interesting. <laughs> um, I would rather point at Spot as a, a general purpose robot, just because you know, we designed it without a particular application in mind. It's a platform where you can customize it for your use. You know, we have a thousand of them out there, which are being used in a reasonably diverse set of uh, environments. And so, you know, we're finding out how well uh, that works. Uh, you know, can you amortize the, the technical investment in the platform and have it really pay off for a, a wide variety of, uh, of use cases? Um, you know, at the Institute, we're in a planning phase where we have a list of projects uh, that we're contemplating doing, and we're getting all our talented people to say things about what they'd like to do, and getting the balance between trying to have robots that do everything and mm -hmm. robots that do one thing is, you know, a hot topic for us. And we're probably going to pick a couple of activities that span that space and, uh, you know, see how it works out. Yeah, I mean, certainly there are a lot of there are a lot of stops on the path to a you know a real general purpose robot. But I but I have to ask, you know, you brought it up. What were your thoughts on the Tesla Optimus demo? Oh, uh, I thought that um, uh, they they'd gotten a lot more done than I expected, uh, and they still have a long way to go. Uh, I thought that their design was. Uh, was it was interesting that cosmetic, you know, the second robot that wasn't really working but was on stage. I mean, cosmetically, it was very interesting. And uh, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a Tesla driver. I've had a couple of them. Uh, I really admire uh, Elon. Uh, you know, despite the recent Twitter activity, I think uh, you know he's a brilliant guy, and uh, I absolutely wouldn't count him out. And we've only got time for we've only got about a minute left, and I, and I have to ask you why was it important that the company signed the weaponized robotics pledge? Uh, you know, I think that there was a lot of sentiment among the employees that uh, that we should, um, uh, you know, be uh, be good about uh, the robots. You know, the robots aren't suitable for weaponizing. Uh, there's so many additional concerns if a robot were to be weaponized. And uh, we just wanted to say, uh, you know, we shouldn't be doing it with ease. I think there was some unhappiness that it looked like uh, some of the other companies had uh, just kind of flung a weapon on there without mm -hmm. maybe necessarily considering all the safety things. I mean, as much as anything, it's a, a friendly fire type worry, you know, if you have something that's that's not doing what it's supposed to do. Great. Uh, unfortunately, we are all out of time. Um, Mark, I appreciate it as always. And hopefully I will see you uh, in a few weeks in Boston. Great. Good talking to you. Take it easy.